Hello. We've talked a little bit about Not Chelsea this morning already, but I just want to give you a little bit more information and explain a little bit more how it came about and how it works. So it would be really easy for this um, presentation to be taken as a critique and a diss to a whole bunch of other codecs that exist currently, and that's not what I intend to do at all. There has been um, quite a long time since we've had a new GPU-powered codec come about, um, and uh, technologies have changed on GPUs um, over that time, and we are making uh, good use of that. But when we set out to make Notch LC, we didn't actually set out to make necessarily a playback uh, codec. We set out to go away and make a transcoding format, something that you could use as you were um, moving your composite, uh, composites between something like Notch um, and Premiere or any of your other editing packages, um, something that could be a really decent interchange um, codec. So if it's going to be an intermediate format, um, it needs to be very high quality. Traditionally, we've been using things like ProRes to be able to do those types of activities, and we need to be up there in terms of that type of quality. We need to have crazy fast encode and decode because the size of the canvases that you are all working on has just ballooned over the last five years with the advent of um, the pixel pictures coming there to like 0 0.8 and 20, uh, 20, uh, um, 20 K projectors and 30 of them all in a row. Um, the, 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 uh, the canvases are just getting huge. Um, with any codec that you're using um, in, a, in a media server or a, a non-linear editor, you need to be able to scrub. And that means every frame needs to be stored in the codec. You can't have a frame and then a bunch of um, uh, intra-frames, deltas, all the way through, and then you drop into the next one. You have to have, for every frame, you have to have a full frame um, of data. And we really wanted to resolve some of the existing issues that, um, that surround GPU codec quality issues, things like gradients. And as we move into the world of um, higher bit rates, uh, we wanted something that uh, allowed you to have around about a 10-bit level of accuracy um, in these large canvases. But none of this is useful unless we have a reasonable level of compression. And so our target was 8 to 1 um, uh, against a, a, a raw frame. And lastly, we all know that we work in a cross-platform world, and we didn't want to produce a codec that could only be used on a PC. So we have made code paths to be able to run on Macs as well, so you can work with um, other content parties uh, on different platforms. So how does Notch fit in quality-wise um, with the other codecs that exist in the world? Well. I've just taken a very small sampling and, um, uh, of Codex, and there isn't a huge amount of science uh, on this page. But at the lower end of things uh, in the GPU Codex space, we have, we have something like HAP or DXV. HAPQ is great um, in terms of uh, uh, you know, giving us a, a nice, decent bump uh, in, terms, uh, in terms of what could be achieved with the GPU codec. ProRes 422 actually sits kind of around the HAPQ uh, uh, quality range with the exceptions of uh, things like chroma gradients. And then at the top end, we have uh, ProRes 4444. And we wanted to land somewhere up here, because um, that's the gap that people had today. Yeah. So as we went about developing the codec, the first thing you have to do is test it. And testing the quality of uh, codecs is a, uh, it's not actually an easy task. Um, you need to test for a lot of different types of scenarios. So these are some of the samples that we used. Um, so in the top left here, you've got something that's high detail, high contrast. Um, we've got something with uh, a lot of Luma um, uh, uh, variation and detail in it. Some motion graphics over here, something which has got lots of different types of uh, saturations and changes in the chroma space, a little bit more motion graphics, and then the dreaded chroma gradients on the bottom right hand side. So if you go to a broadcast conference and you talk about quality of codecs, you can basically find about 20 different views in the pub at any given time. After a few drinks, it might lead to a bit of a punch up. But there, are, there have been messages such as PSNR and MSE, which have all been about um, taking the absolute difference of each pixel and, and comparing it uh, to the compressed um, uh, codec output. So 
What differs with um, the measures that we're using, which is SIM, which is rapidly becoming um, uh, the, the standard for codec measurements, is rather than looking at every single difference in pixels, you actually need to look at the structural integrity of an image. So that's about, can you see the structures? Because that's when you can see the structures and the contrast of lines and things like that, that's when your eye can start to see breakdowns and errors occurring. So SIM is a measure that really encapsulates that. And you can actually test this um, subjectively with your eye um, when you look at the, sim, uh, the various SIM samples. But um, we think it's the best measure. Um, we measure against PSNR as well and MSE, but um, we really are strongly biased towards SIM. And when you measure um, not Chelsea uh, in terms of its error, uh, its SIM error, these are the types of results that you get. So the lower the number, the lesser the error, and therefore the higher the quality. So across the tests that I showed you before, you see HAP ProRes 42, HAP Q somewhere in the middle, ProRes 444, and not Chelsea at 100. Now, I'm not going to pretend that we win every single type of, um, of, of image um, quality for every, every single type of scenario. But um, five out of six of those, we beat ProRes 444. The, the, the spaces that we don't um, are, are actually quite minimal. OK, so a quick summary. Um, on the SIM measure, uh, we have a two-time reduction in error over ProRes 4444, um, six, over, six times over HAPQ, 12 over ProRes 422, and 13 over HAP. So it's a significant increase um, in quality. But let's talk about gradients. If you've used the GPU power codec at any point over the last seven years, you have uh, been failed by the codecs that you've used. And um, <laughs> Um, it's just, it's, it, it just kills you when you see your content um, being destroyed um, and you just avoid gradients like the plague as much as you can. So this is a, um, a gradient in, uh, in HAP, a chroma gradient um, in HAP. Now we're on a projector here with the only sunny day we've had in London for the last six weeks <laughs> blasting through the back. So this is going to be a little bit difficult to see, but I hope you can see uh, the banding that, um, uh, that is coming through um, uh, on this image. If I zoom in a little bit, you can see it a little bit better, um, but we are all quite familiar with this. Now, I've got two numbers down in the bottom right hand uh, corner here. The first is the error, the SIM error, and the second is the, uh, the bit rate um, at, uh, at HD. So um, we have a, uh, an error uh, of uh, 20747 and about a meg a second with HAP to produce this gradient. This is HAPQ. Still have the banding issues in the chroma range. Um, HAPQ um, helps a lot with Luma, but not necessarily chroma. Um, we've got two zeros and 549 on our error, and we've doubled uh, the disk. Um, uh, read write. And this is not Chelsea. So you cannot, this is at our, uh, um, at, uh, not, not our best, but at our optimal level um, uh, when you choose in the codec which level of uh, compression you want. So this is optimal level. Uh, we have three zeros now and a one nine, which is a significant drop um, in error. But our bit rate is only 600k more than HAPQ, so it's only 30% more um, than, than HAPQ uh, to achieve that type of gradient. And there you can see it zoomed in. I am quite blind, but I still can't see any banding there. All right, so when it comes to gradients, we always get perfect gradients, 30 times uh, less error than HAP, 20 times less error than HAPQ, and two and a half times less error than uh, ProRes 422. Codec is only useful if you can um, transcode to it quickly. And I don't think it will surprise anybody that the Notch LC codec is all about the GPU. So we do all our encoding and decoding using compute um, on the GPU. And that means that if you have a powerful GPU inside your PC, like a 1080 Ti, 
you're going to get the benefit of that. And when NVIDIA bring out the card the next year with 15 or 20% more power, you're going to get 15 to 20% um, better performance on your, your encode. Um, so it will continue to scale and get faster um, as GPUs get faster. But when you are, um, it, when you are encoding, this is HD tests, um, and we were um, around about, on average, about 2.3 times faster than HAPQ, um, which is actually quite quick to encode. But HAP is the one that use, people use uh, mostly, and we're 15 times to 25 times um, faster than HAP. I've seen people use this a couple of times, and it's, uh, um, it's, it's always nice when you can actually encode the video faster than play it back. Right. A codec on its own is absolutely useless unless it gets adoption elsewhere. And as Matt mentioned previously, Notch LC uh, is, is free to use. You don't, there's no attachment. You don't have to buy Notch to be able to, uh, to, to use it. Um, it's free for the industry. The plugins for Adobe will be free for the industry um, as well. Um, we put it, um, the first version of it into 0.921 in Notch Builder. We've got um, a refresh coming on it on 0.922. Um, uh, and um, as it stands, uh, Disguise have uh, committed to integrating Notch LC, um, and a couple of others are just about to uh, uh, announce that they're going to be supporting uh, Notch LC as well, as I mentioned, the Adobe plugins coming up. Right. When we're running in a media server, obviously there are certain things that you care about with a codec. One is um, how fast can you play it back. Um, it is very fast. I, think I would go as far as to call it best in class. A lot of the, um, the workload is actually pushed to the GPU and not the CPU, um, uh, which is very helpful. And when, you, when we're doing uploads to the GPU, uh, if I take a quick step back, if, you, uh, if you're running something like ProRes um, or you're running a CPU side codec, um, you do your decompression on the CPU, and then you have to take your raw texture and upload the entire raw texture to the GPU. And there is a constraint between the CPU and the GPU, and you get um, a bottleneck, which stops you from being able to push through. When you have a GPU-powered codec, you take your compressed data on the CPU um, and um, push that up to the, uh, the GPU, and it's like one-eighth the size as you push up, so you remove that issue of uh, a bottleneck between the CPU and the GPU. And when you're running at full quality with Notch LC, um, we're finding that you're getting files which are about 30% larger than HAPQ. Um, obviously, with the advent of massive RAID systems, NVMe, um, uh, and SSDs, um, disk read rates have, have gone through the roof. So we don't see this as being as too much of an issue. So quick summary of, of what you're getting there. Six times the reductions uh, in error against common high quality GPU codecs, removal of all chroma gradient issues, um, uh, a 30 for a, a cost of about a 30% increase in disk size, um, double the encoding speed over something like HAPQ, and a 10-bit level response, and it has alpha support as well. So how are we doing this? Um, I'll give just a little bit of insight into how the codec works uh, in the back end. So if you talk to any media server developer, um, they will uh, talk about a texture format called DXT, which is very common, common um, in codecs. And DXT is a, com is a GPU compression format, which takes your raw and compressed image and then makes it into a nice malleable format um, that the GPU uh, can decode. Uh, it um, came about with um, the advent of things like DirectX um, in the early days, and it hasn't really moved on too much. The problem with 565 in the DXT um, texture pattern is this. If you give us an 8-bit RGB image, so you've got 8 bits of data on each of those color channels, um, as soon as you convert something to this DXT format, which is used in DXV and HAP, it instantly knocks the bit rate for each of those color, uh, colors down to 5, 6, and 5. Um, and if you add those up, you'll see 16 bits, which is why you get to that round number. So before you've even done any block compression or anything like that, you've just dropped the accuracy of your color, uh, colors down by um, three to two bits. So you're taking 24 bits of data and you're squeezing it down to 16 bits of data. So there is instant loss at that point before we start doing block compression. With Notch, we're taking a slightly different approach. So you can give us eight, 10, or actually even 16 bit um, images. And rather than um, converting to RGB, we actually convert to YUV. 
And by doing that, we can do um, some important um, weightings to how we're going to go away and do our um, uh, bit depth compression. So YUV obviously divides up um, uh, a color into its luma properties, so how bright it is, and its chroma properties, as in what color it is. And um, what we do is we say we know from um, uh, subjectively and uh, from the science behind it that the places where you most uh, need the bit depth is in the luma. When you're doing gradients and you've got that, um, you know, you've got that sky that's running from top to bottom, you're getting some saturation change in it as well. Um, but luma is the place where you really desperately need the detail. So we weight 12 bits of data um, uh, to the luma, and we give um, 16 bits to the uh, to the chroma. So we've got a total of 28 bits uh, going out the other end. You can't do a hard comparison from 2430 to 28 bits because we're moving to YUV, but you get the idea. So instead of dropping something down to 16 bits, we're taking it up to around 28 bits. So we've retained all of the information that was provided um, to us in our bit depth, and then we've got to go away and do um, block compression. Um, please, and you might be glazing over a little bit, just bear with me for a second, but block compression um, is whereby you take an image and um, rather than holding the detail for every single pixel, you find these blocks, and in these blocks, you take a sample of color um, at one side of the block and a sample of color at the other corner of the block, and then you have control points between it that say, how have I moved from this color to this color? And you spread that, uh, spread that out, and then the, the codecs take all of those blocks, they drop them down onto disk, and when you're decoding, it gives the two, the two, uh, the two uh, interpolant points at either side, and it fills in all the gaps with the control points between those two places. If you're using something like DXV or HAP, you'll have four by four um, blocks. In Notch LC, we actually have adaptive block sizes. So uh, we have four by four, eight by eight, and 16 by 16. And the, um, the encoder works out, hey, I've got a massive block of black or transparent. I can have a 16 by 16 block, and I can compress that down really quickly because I've got a large block there. Or, hey, I've got a super detailed area that I need to be, have far more detail on. OK, I'm going to give it a four by four block. Not only that, um, in uh, codecs that have been before, the control points that go between these two places have always been a fixed um, uh, 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 data rate. So you've either had two or three bit control points. In Notch, again, this, uh, Notch LC, again, this is totally adaptive. So we look at the content which is within that block and say, hey, can we get away with one bit because it's just black or there's not much changing between, it, uh, between those two control points? Or is this super detailed and we need to be able to give four bits of, um, of data on each of those control points between the, two, uh, between the two sides. I hope that makes sense. So that's a little bit about the how, um, and now a little bit about the future. Depending how Notch LC goes over the next year, um, we have been approached about producing potentially two other um, iterations of Notch LC. One which is called Notch LC Ultra, and in Notch LC Ultra, people are asking for us, rather than having 12, 8, um, 8 uh, for our um, bit depths, to basically move to 16 across the board. Um, so ridiculously high. Um, this will be really good um, uh, for when you're starting to put out other passes, which aren't necessarily just an RGB pass. You might be going through depth passes and things like that and exporting those um, out of Notch. And the other side is Notch LC Lite, which is taking some of these kind of adaptive bit rates um, within blocks um, and applying those um, uh, to a much lighter and faster codec um, with uh, slightly less quality. But we will see how we go over the next little while. Um, uh, and uh, we're not making any timeline commitments uh, to, to these at the moment. All right, thank you.